All right. Okay. Wonderful. So global sentence properties rather than local probabilities drive word form selection. Yep. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Um, you know, my mom was joking that it uh, would have been really great for me to be in Paris, but she asked how my trip to Paris is going today. So uh, I will update her soon. Um, this is a really fun project because I think that there's this huge question within language production research about how speakers are able to pick between the words that they're uh, really trying to optimize between. They have to make decisions really quickly. And more specifically, uh, speakers have to conceptualize an idea and turn that into some kind of signal or some kind of utterance plan, either signed or spoken language. And um, speakers are faced with a really wide variety of choices. So in principle, there's no restrictions on what we decide to call something. So if I'm asked to name this picture of this sort of small hairy ape, I can choose to name it with a number of different options. So for example, I might choose a longer word like a chimp, uh, chimpanzee, or I might choose a shorter word like chimp. Um, but these words are rarely produced in isolation. And this is the biggest thing about existing models of language production is we don't really understand how lexical selection interacts with the surrounding words that we're choosing. And so that's what this talk is ideally gonna focus on. We're gonna see what factors modulate the choice between short words versus long words uh, for a given reference. Okay. So we know for sure that words are usually produced within larger utterances. The fact that sort of surrounding language has clear impacts on language production comes from evidence on speech error data, as well as planning times for multi-word utterance production. Um, so we want to look at uh, this broader context uh, in which you know, we have a multi-word utterance that we're trying to convey. We might have entities such as this chimp, chimpanzee, uh, you know, the scientist, uh, and some sort of scientific reasoning that they're engaged in. Uh, speakers are really trying to produce something that's stylistically coherent and often try and produce something in a consistent register. So uh, if I was going to write a scientific paper, I might say it's primatologist hypothesize that the chimpanzee. Um, but if I was just talking more colloquially, I might say something like scientists believe that the chimp and so on. Um, so short words often go with other short words. And uh, most of the accounts of language production don't really account for these types of multi-word dynamics. Give me a moment. Oh, buddy, I know. Um, Okay, so uh, with that in mind, you know, we can think about broader accounts, uh, some, some of which are uh, really expressive. So information theoretic accounts allow for us to look at multi-word utterance production. And so in these accounts, speakers are optimizing the word forms that they produce within the context of uh, the surrounding words. Typically they mean the upstream words, uh, so the immediately prior context, um, and speakers are thought to sort of move between uh, different options depending on, you know, uh, the word form should mirror the probability of that uh, sort of message that they're trying to convey. And so uh, our goal in this study is to follow up on a study by uh, Mawald, Federenko, Piantadosi, and Gibson, who looked at the relationship between these information theoretic constraints, specifically which they quantify using surprisal, and uh, lexical selection. So um, we're gonna try and zoom out and see these broader effects of uh, basically these discourse related factors, these register related factors, and these local uh, sort of multi-word surprisal uh, effects on uh, lexical choice. And uh, I'm gonna try and define for you the global properties that we're interested in. So, um, you know, we think that uh, multi-word production has uh, re reflects Things like the register that we're trying to speak in, is it spoken, is it written, uh, you know, is it a formal versus an informal context, even things like my emotional state or and the discourse status of reference are going to affect uh, the realization of word forms that I choose. So uh, we have a whole lot of contextual factors, global properties of an utterance, the sort of uh, all the ambient information that can be encoded in uh, speakers messages. And some of these may be correlated with surprisal. So for example, uh, low frequency words are going to uh, occur in low probability sequences and so on. Um, 
So if we go back uh, to reconsider this figure where we have the scientist, the chimpanzee and its scientific thinking, we actually have to consider that speakers are choosing to produce these words simultaneously. And so they have to optimize their choices uh, together. And so um, we should be able to predict the choices of speakers' words from the properties of the surrounding words that they are, are also going to be processing. And to look at this, we actually conducted two experiments, one of which is a rating-based task that we, uh, that we conducted on Qualtrics. And uh, another is a corpus study where we attempted to transfer uh, all of our findings from the rating task of our participants to real world sentences. And we're gonna be looking at choices of short and long words like chimp and chimpanzee that we took from the Mawald et al. study. Uh, we're going to be comparing these short-term surprisal effects to broader effects of the frequencies of the words in the context as a proxy for register uh, or formality. Uh, and also uh, we're going to look at a neural network-based predictor uh, that allows us to encode the entire sentence uh, at, at once. So, um, the experiment rating task uh, is very similar to, if you've read the Mawald et al. study before, uh, the sort of binary forced choice uh, task that we have. But in contrast, uh, you know, we're not going to make people do a binary for forced choice. We're actually going to let them modulate between uh, their preferences. So people start out with a slider uh, at the beginning of uh, seeing a sentence. There's a word that's in a blank and uh, it starts at the middle and they're allowed to say whether they think that one word at one extreme sounds better than a word at another extreme, which allows us to look at whether speakers are interested in uh, or believe that a short word is better than a long word and to what extent. Um, we actually used a really uh, large data set of stimuli for this. We took all of these 38 word pairs and generated 10 sentences for each of them, uh, from which uh, half of them were sort of designed to be long biased. So half of the sentences were supposed to encourage chimpanzee relative to chimp, and the other half were designed to support the short form of the sentences. And this allows us to look at a range of factors, um, even if you know, uh, people's intuitions might vary a lot. So with a slider, we uh, have this task uh, in Qualtrics that we recruited uh, 91 participants from the University of Wisconsin, all of whom identified as American English speakers who learned English before age five. Um, each participant rated only one sentence per pair. So they see 38 sentences uh, and uh, you know, there's, there are not a lot of constraints on the sentences otherwise. Um, due to the scale, and you can definitely ask me about this later, we dichotomized the responses. It turns out participants really just want to use the endpoints, uh, but uh, you know, uh, we can talk about the reasons for that later. And we're going to break down uh, our different uh, metrics into uh, different hypotheses. So the very first one is that speakers optimize information density. So under this account, uh, we should be able to correlate uh, measures of surprisal with uh, the proportion of responses that participants think should sound better with a long or a short word. And in order to do that, we use a state-of-the-art neural network model that actually is trained in a similar way to uh, sort of canonical uh, connectionist models uh, in which the model's objective is to predict the next word. So it's a very closed-like task that's very similar to uh, and correlated with a actual closed behavior that um, I can talk about with you as well too. So it takes into account the entire prior context. So it's not just the trigram probabilities or anything like that. Um, then that gives us a probability that we can then turn into a surprisal. And uh, from that, we can actually do a really standard analysis. We can look at the probability that somebody is going to rate either a, a sentence as being better with the short word or better with the long word uh, as a function of surprisal in a mixed effects modeling framework. Um, and what we find is that surprisal is not a significant predictor of preferences. Uh, and that was really surprising to us. Uh, and, but at the same time, we were able to follow up on this by looking at the effects of uh, broader uh, predictors within the sentence. And so for that, we use uh, a measure of the non-local probabilities uh, or the formality of the utterance to constrain choices. So we look at the median log word frequency of all the other words in the context as a proxy for register. The idea here being that low frequency words are typically longer and low frequency words are going to support more low frequency words, which will lead uh, speakers to prefer longer words. So longer words are going to occur with other long words. 
And unlike the surprisal analysis, we actually find that as uh, word frequencies increase, preferences for the short form uh, will also increase. So the rarer something is, all the way here on the left, um, the more likely participants are to rate the uh, words that are long relative to the short words as being better in that sentence. So there's a really nice negative correlation here, uh, which suggests this broader sentence uh, and utterance context is really important for a lexical choice. Okay, so this is just one really uh, sort of quick and dirty proxy. It's not sensitive to the content of the utterance. And so what our next analysis does is attempt to characterize the entire thing. Uh, if you're interested in some of the really specific nitty gritty aspects of this analysis, we can talk about it that at the end. But basically what we do is we use a masked neural language model uh, known as Roberta that is trained on enormous amounts of text and it can really is, is sensitive to enormously sensitive uh, and, and nuanced statistics. And we use that model to generate an embedding. So a very large um, 700 something dimensional uh, vector that we can then pop into a classifier to predict participants ratings. And the nice thing about these masked neural language models is we can hide the critical words from the representation, which means that we're not actually looking at the specifics of chimp versus chimpanzee, but rather something about all of the surrounding words that are in that utterance. Uh, and so we're able to get a generalizable representation of, uh, of basically nothing that's sensitive to the specifics of the pairs of words that we're interested in. And just like the mixed effects modeling framework, we can predict participants' responses in a simple classifier type task. And so from this, uh, we're able to extract a probability that participants will prefer a word given the sentence representation as either short or long. Um, and then we can correlate with that with the probabilities that are actually evident in a participant's ratings. So uh, we can talk about the specifics of this, uh, but it's a leave one out regularized uh, ridge regression classifier model. Um, so with these probabilities, we can say, okay, well, we have a range of uh, the odds that the model thinks that something is going to be long or short given the sentence representation. And we can also see what participants preferences are for long or short over the course of the utterance. And so here we expect to see a positive correlation such that high probability long ratings are going to correlate with participants long ratings. And that's exactly what we see. So uh, the model is able to pick up on these general properties of the surrounding utterance and uh, account for that uh, in participants selections. So that is the more long biased the sentences for all kinds of other sentences, the more likely participants are to actually say that a long word sounds good in that context. So it's really not something specific to the local surprisals, but rather something more broad. Um, okay. So with that in mind, uh, you know, you can say that the, the types of stimuli that are involved in psycholinguistic studies and the uh, sort of task demands of, uh, you know, Qualtrics ratings are not particularly natural. So something that we decided to do uh, in experiment two was take our models of human ratings and predict the, given the same sentence embeddings, real world sentence realizations. And so uh, from this, we can say, we're going to take sentences from the corpus of contemporary American English, which has a really great coverage of all kinds of uh, uses of these short and long words uh, to predict the, uh, to, to produce predicted ratings of length. And then we're just going to correlate the predicted probabilities that a long word would have been preferable to our participants with whether the word was actually long or not. So uh, we're going to use these same Roberta based embeddings uh, so we can have a compressed sentence representation that's sensitive to all the content within it. Um, and we'll pop that into another mixed effects model uh, where we're able to uh, really tease apart uh, the effect of these predicted probabilities on the form realization of natural sentences. And so uh, what we expect to see here is another positive correlation. So specifically, uh, the more the model thinks that participants would have preferred a long word in that sentence, we should see more sentences actually containing that long word. And that is exactly what we see in the COCA analyses. So this is really encouraging. Uh, what this suggests is that these broader properties of the utterance are really driving uh, 
uh, participants' uh, preferences, and that this is not constrained to uh, the experimental based stimuli, and it's not constrained to um, the artificial nature of um, the uh, specific word forms that we're using. So it's really something about these distributional regularities about what kinds of words occur with what other kinds of words are really uh, affecting lexical selection. And so uh, our take home points, uh, before I dive into some of the uh, broader uh, sort of implications for these results is that there's not strong evidence for surprisal driving word form selection. Uh, what we end up finding, in fact, is that surprisal has basically no effect in conjunction with any of these other features. Um, and instead, these other factors, such as the frequencies of the surrounding words or the interactions between the surrounding words and each other, uh, really constrain the biases that uh, speakers have for uh, what words should occur uh, in a given uh, environment. Um, one of the things that's challenging about these results for both information theoretic accounts um, and uh, canonical models of language production is that we don't really have a model of multi-word selection. And in particular, we don't have a good model of the interactions between lexical selection at one uh, for one word in an utterance impacting the lexical selection of another word. And so what we really need are models that can extend uh, maybe and, and perhaps integrate information theoretic approaches to lexical selection with a uh, realistic uh, sentence and utterance production. And more importantly, I think what this underscores is the lack of contact between psycholinguistic research and more sociolinguistic uh, or interpersonal discourse related factors. So there are very few models that are sensitive to things like register or genre uh, and it, with this, I think that we're really motivating uh, further work in this area. So uh, with that, uh, you know, I think that uh, we have plenty of time for questions. I would like to thank all of the people from the lab, uh, especially my RAs who did a lot of work to create these sentences, uh, as well as Arya McCarthy for his engineering work and getting some of these models to uh, produce surprises for me and things. So um, with that, uh, I think uh, I would like to take some questions and uh, would like to, uh, yeah, uh, know some more about what you are thinking about. Um, one second. <laughs>